I must say I have a little problem. It's, it's a severe problem. My lecture contains several video clips which cannot be presented here for technical reasons. So I try to do my best without uh, the video clips. But if I could have the first title. From this order to order. In this lecture, I would like to address some of the question which was posed. Should, should do it from here? It doesn't work here. It doesn't work. Yeah. So, okay. There were two questions formulated in the prologue, which I want to address in this lecture, and I want to give some answer based on experimental evidence we'll show you during this lecture. Can science render apparently complex systems in simple underlying theories? And second, has a complex system necessarily to be complicated? I start with some quotation. No. No. From Erwin Schrödinger, in his inaugural lecture at the University of Zurich in 1921, he stated, the physical research has clearly demonstrated that for the phenomena whose regularity and continuity has led to the formulation of the postulate of general causality, the common origin for the observed strict laws has to be sought in the accident. That means statistics comes into play and disorder. So we expect that a system of non-interacting particles, which is isolated, would show complete disorder, like the molecules of air around us. Nevertheless, if you look around in nature, there's a lot of order. Even on the lowest level of the inorganic world, we find order. For example, this is mineral, cuprite. It's a copper oxide showing perfectly ordered arrangements. And we can even go one step down on the atomic scale and look for the arrangements of these atoms in a crystal. This is an aluminum 111 surface with perfect arrangement of the aluminum atoms in the topmost layer. And in the following, I will take this kind of systems, so two-dimensional surfaces, as our probe for investigating these questions I uh, formulated at the beginning. If such a surface is exposed to a gas phase, the molecules from the gas phase will impinge and will have chemical interactions called adsorbed. And in this case, we can probe also the atoms which have been interacting with the surface. This, for example, shows a platinum 111 surface with a bright dots, the platinum atoms, after interaction with a small number of oxygen molecules at 165 Kelvin. Even at this low temperature, the oxygen molecules are split, they are dissociated, they form these new bright dots separated by five to eight angstroms from each other, surrounded by dark areas. The bright dots mark the positions of the oxygen atoms, the dark areas, the local modification of the electronic structure. And the fact that they are not on neighboring sides but separated by five to eight angstroms is a consequence of the fact that the energy which is released during the bond formation has been transferred to the salt and it takes some time, time scale, in this case about 30 femtoseconds. If we keep such a system at this temperature, nothing will happen. But if you look at the energetics, We show here on the left-hand side the energetics of an atom interacting with the surface along the z-axis. It has a minimum determined by the adsorption energy and the lifetime on the surface 
is exponentially dependent on this adsorption energy and on temperature. Um, at, at T is temperature. So if we go up with temperature, also the lifetime will go down and eventually the particle goes back into the gas phase. We can also move the particle parallel to the surface. This is on the right hand side. Then it jumps from one side to the next one by overcoming an activation air barrier for surface diffusion. And this activation barrier is much smaller and this means the, res means the residence time of such an atom on the side is much shorter than the lifetime on the surface. It jumps from one side to the next and so on. And if you now look for a situation at room temperature, this is a number of oxygen atoms on a ruthenium surface at room temperature, and this is a snapshot taken in 70 milliseconds. The oxygen atoms are randomly distributed, as we assume, but they are now moving because the temperature is high enough so that they can be diffused around. And the next figure would now be a film, which is not there, where you can see how these particles jump around. On the average, they stay about 60 milliseconds at a certain site. If they come close together, they stick a little, a little bit longer together because there is a weak attractive force between neighboring oxygen atoms. And this has a consequence that at higher coverage, the distribution of the atoms across the surface is no longer random and uniform, but we have a separation in two phases. This emergence of a new phenomena we now have a diluted phase, a quasi two-dimensional gas phase, and a condensed phase, a two-dimensional crystal phase. And this is the situation for thermal equilibrium of such a system. And this thermal equilibrium is characterized by the minimum of the free energy. The free energy composed of the internal energy U and the entropy. If you have attractive forces, the energy will become negative if they come together, and if the temperature is low enough, so this negative energy, energy determines the equilibrium, and we have no longer a completely disordered state, but we have the formation of ordered structures. This is a reason for the formation of crystals and solids. This is a kind of dead order, because we have a closed system, there is no exchange of matter with the surrounding, and uh, this is what we usually deal with in thermodynamics. However, there is another kind of order if you look, look around in nature. And this is shown here. This is a larger scale now, the retina, the elements of your eye on the 10 micrometer scale, or the pattern of such an animal, also on macroscopic scale, order formation. And it's not only a spatial order, there is also a temporal evolution of, of the order. And this question was heavily debated, for example, by Erwin Schrödinger again, who in 1943 gave a series of lectures in Dublin under the title, What is Life?, which was later published as a book. And this book marks one of the landmarks of molecular biology because for the first time it made public that the building blocks of biology are chemically in nature, the genes. But this was not the purpose of this uh, uh, book. Erwin Schrödinger tried to find out are there other laws to describe living matter than we know from physics? Do we need new physical laws? He could not give an answer to that. He only has, 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 uh, concluded that this kind of order, the living order, is not characteristic for chemical uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, but is characteristic for open systems far from equilibrium. And the first two was, give, was to give a solution of this problem, how structure can be formed in such systems far from equilibrium, was a great mathematician, Alan Turing who wrote a paper, The Chemical Basis of Morphogenesis. And it reads, it is suggested that a system of chemical substances reacting together through a tissue is adequate to account for the main phenomena of morphogenesis. Such a system also, it may be quite homogeneous, 
may later develop a pattern or structure due to an instability of the homogeneous equilibrium. And now the point is, with such reaction diffusion systems, stationary waves may appear. So it's the interplay between reaction and diffusion. The theory does not make any new hypothesis. It merely suggests that certain well-known physical laws are sufficient to account for many of the facts. The full theory of these effects was later developed by Ilya Brikoshin, and uh, we introduced the so-called dissipative structures. Now we are going back to our surface, and we look for an example where we can study these open systems far from equilibrium in order to study this kind of living order formation on a very simple system, again, two-dimensional surface interacting with small molecules from the gas phase. And this can be done with a catalyst. Heterogeneous catalysis based on the fact that a catalyst is interacting with molecules from the gas phase, either by forming bonds or by dissociating the molecules, and then the particles can diffuse across the surface, as we have seen before, and may interact with each other with each other and form new molecules which return to the gas phase. And in this uh, case, if you have a continuous flow of reacting molecules in flow, we will also have a continuous f number of product molecules flying out. And the reaction rate depends and depends on the external parameters, the temperature, and the concentrations of the reaction, uh, pa reacting particles and the catalyst itself. For example, your car exhaust catalyst is of this type. It exposes planes of platinum or platinum metals to the gases which have to be removed, in this case, carbon monoxide and oxygen. The oxygen molecules we have seen before are dissociating. They form chemisorbed atoms on the surface, and the CO molecules diffuse across the surface faster than the oxygen atoms. And when they meet each other, they can recombine and return into the gas phase as CO2. And in this way, a continuous flow of oxygen and CO will also form a continuous production of CO2. Depending on the nature of the catalyst, the partial pressures, and the temperature. And this will usually always be the case. With some exceptions, and such an exception is shown here. This was a platinum single crystal surface exposed to carbon monoxide and oxygen. Temperature was constant, the CO pressure was constant, and at the point marked by an arrow, the oxygen pressure was increased from 2 to 2.7 times 10 minus 4 millibar, and the rate started to increase slowly, and then it started to oscillate, to vary periodically, and this continues over hours. This is complexity. Something which we would ne never ha had expected that under continuous flow conditions where we keep everything constant, the response of the system is oscillatory in time. And if you look around, we find many other examples of this kind. For example, in population dynamics. This figure shows the number of furs from hairs and lynxes which were delivered to the Hudson Bay Company over the years. And they are not constant. They are periodically oscillating. And there's always some phase delay between the number of hairs and the number of lynxes. And there's a very simple explanation. If there are many hairs, the lynxes will find enough food. So they will increase their population. And as a consequence, more of the hairs will be disappearing. So they will die out. And with some delay, the lynxes will start to starve. And then the hairs can be recovering. And this effect has been known for many years, and in the 20s already two mathematicians developed a model, the so-called lotka volterra model, in order to account for this phenomena. In terms of two ordinary coupled differential equations, expressing the variation of the concentration of hairs with time as proportional to the number of hairs, alpha on x minus, disappearance of hairs by interaction with the lynxes, x times y. And the second equation is the change of the population of the lynxes. 
they increase if they have enough to eat, beta one times x times y minus their natural death rate. These are top two coupled nonlinear equations because the two variables are nonlinear coupled. And the solution of these equations under certain conditions show indeed this oscillatory behavior as we have seen. So the concentration of the hairs, the full line, and the concentration of the lynxes, the dotted line. This is a solution to the problem. And this is why this, pro this area is sometimes called nonlinear dynamics. These are nonlinear differential equations which are able to account for this degree of complexity. Now we go back to our uh, problem with the carbon monoxide oxidation. We know everything about the carbon monoxide adsorption, the oxygen adsorption, the reaction by recombination of oxygen and CO, and we can establish the equations describing the kinetics of these phenomena. There's a third equation. There's a third equation which is related to the structure of the surface. So we have three variables, three variables where we know everything from atomic microscopic observations. We can insert these parameters in the equations. We can solve them. And indeed, the solution shows this oscillatory behavior. So again, like with the lotka uh, problem, we have a solution for a complex behavior of two interacting species. <clears throat> this is not the whole story, because if we have a macroscopic system like a catalyst surface interacting with CO and oxygen, or a population of IRs and links in a large area, there must be some kind of coupling between the dif different regions in order to synchronize the overall behavior. And this is then gives rise to what is called spatio-temporal self-organization. These are open systems far from equilibrium, and there we have a continuous production of free energy, an inflow of free energy, and this causes temporal as well as spatial variation of the state variables. This is living order. And the equations describing these effects are of the type of reaction and diffusion, like in Turing's paper. So variation of the concentration changes with time. This is the kinetics, and this is the transport term, the diffusion term. And of course, if there is coupling between different areas on the surface, we should also observe the formation of structures on the surface. It means non-uniform distribution of the, absorbing, of the absorbed species. And the length scale in this case is not given by the atomic scale, but by the coupling of reaction and diffusion, the so-called diffusion lengths, which can be much larger. And this is one of the examples which we observe with our system. We probe the distribution of the adsorbed species on the surface with a technique which is called photoelectron emission microscopy, which is sensitive to the local dipole moments. And in this case, the dark areas are areas which are essentially covered by oxygen, and the bright areas are covered by carbon monoxide. And you see these elliptical waves here. They are elongated because this is the direction on the surface along which the diffusion is faster than perpendicular to it. And if you can now have the movie, if it works, we will see how this pattern propagates. First movie, B. Huh? Sorry. No, no, this is not what's the first one. This is number three. <laughs> this is number three, but number one. Number one.
Yeah, here we are. So you see these elliptical waves propagate across the surface and simultaneously the background switches between dark and bright. That means the overall reaction rate varies periodically. So this switching of the background is synchronous everywhere. And there's, apart from diffusion, another mechanism coming into play for coupling. If we have a reacting system and we are consum consumption of the, one of the kind of molecules at one part, there will be a gradient of the concentration in the gas phase. And the molecules in the gas phase are fa very fast, 1,000 meter per, per second. So the propagation of the information is very fast. And this, in this way, almost instantaneously, the whole surface will be synchronized. And this can go further. Next figure, no, no, no. Next figure, no, no. Switch off. No, no, no. I want to con continue with this. Okay. Okay. No. Wrong. Slide, not, not film. I'm so sorry about that. Once again, you see the scale here. It's, it's 500 micrometers. It's, it's not atomic scale. It's determined by the rate constant and the diffusion length. The next figure, next, next slide, next slide, not film. Yeah, this is a standing wave under other conditions that we have really now is coupling through the gas phase dominating and we get standing waves of our concentrations. And analogy. Next figure. Yeah. This reminds to this pattern formation in nature. And still another example from nature. Next film. Film number two. No. Film number two, this is three. Incredible. There are fireflies in Malaysia. They communicate through light, and this is almost instantaneous. So they are blinking periodically, and the whole colonies blink at the same time. So this is a single firefly. They are living in colonies, and if they are blinking together, we get whole colonies blinking synchronously. Most common are spirals. Spiral waves are observed very frequently, and this is a typical spiral wave formation during our catalytic reaction. We have always constant steady state conditions, constant temperature, the length scale half a millimeter. And again, a film now. This shows how these spirals propagate Dark areas are oxygen covered, bright are carbon monoxide covered. And look if two spirals collide, they form this kind of protrusions here. In this case, at each side on the dark area reacts about 10 times per second. 
to form a CO2. So it's a quite different time scale since the propagation of the waves, which is of the order of about several micrometers per second. So thank you. Next figure. So spirals can be found in many different areas of our nature. Galaxies are spirals. Also hurricane, which we have just experienced recently, is also. And the oldest example for spirals I have found at the Isle of Myland, of, of My Malta, in Taxian. It's about 5,000 year old, and you see these spirals with the protrusions. It's amazing. Going back to our reaction. This was a mechanism and these were the equations describing the kinetics, but we have to include now also the diffusion. And that's why these equations are transformed into partial differential equations. A set of three coupled partial differential equations, and we included just the motion of the fastest species, the adsorptio. And we can now solve numerically the set of three coupled differential equations. Very simple equations to write down. And starting with a uniform random distribution, we see that slowly these spirals are evolution, evolving. So without any additional assumptions with these very simple systems, we get this formation of spirals, depending very strictly on the external parameters. If you change these parameters a little bit, also the nature of the spiral change, they break up and form this disordered state. This is called spiral turbulence, or the spatial temporal chaos, which is also very typical for this system, the transition to chaos. And this would be another experimental verification of this turbulent state, where we can see how the spirals break up and go over to the turbulent state. Again, analogy, this is our surface. This is from the sketchbook of Leonardo da Vinci. You see again the turbulent state. So we have to conclude that we are obviously at the edge of chaos. And we can ask ourselves, is there any possibility to stabilize the chaos? And nature obviously is doing this by feedbacks. So we can also include a feedback mechanism in our system and in this way also stabilize the steady state over the turbulent state. This is what not nature is doing in order to overcome the chaotic or turbulent state. We couple the result of our reaction to the inlet of the reacting species, and in this way we can change our spirals into new stationary states. This is the end. I will come back to the questions. Can science render apparently complex systems in simple underlying theories? And has a complex system necessarily been complicated? No. It was a simple system, two molecules with a single crystal surface showing all these features of complexity. And the theory is very simple again, which is able to describe the overall complexity. And at the end, I will show the vision of an artist of complexity, Vincent van Gogh, where we find again all these elements, the target patterns, the spiral, spiral waves, the turbulent state, the standing waves. And his conclusion was, for the great things are not done by mere impulse, but by a series of small things brought together, or in other words, from atoms to complexity. Thank you very much.